got about three minutes here. Um, good morning. First off, I want to thank Andrew Scoggin Bank for being the sponsor for this webinar education series. I'm Jim Chalmers with Chalmers Camp Insurance Program. Um, and with us today, Drummond Woodson, who is going to spend some time speaking on the impact of cannabis legislation for Maine summer camps. This really stemmed from a conversation that started this past summer at Migas Lodge um, at a Maine summer camp board meeting. Um, some of you just watched me melt my words for the last 10 minutes, so I'm going <laughs> to compact my introduction here um, briefly and just speak in the extent of after that meeting at Migas Lodge, I knew exactly who to reach out to and talk to and see if um, Drummond Woodson, Hannah King would be willing to spend some time and share their thoughts um, and expertise on the cannabis industry for us. They're, they're a law firm that spends, um, you know, they represent about 80 to 90 percent of the school districts in the state. They've also helped with um, writing and part of the legislation for the state of Maine for the medical and I believe the recreational yeah. use, the adult use um, of marijuana as well. We are recording this, so it will be available um, for folks later on. You can certainly type in your questions. Um, and Dan Rose and Hannah will certainly get to them, or as many as they can, and, and hopefully answer them for you. And, and for those of you who later on can share with others for this webinar. Um, again, I'm going I'm to shorten the, the bio reach here. Uh, very impressive group, and we're excited to have Hannah and Dan present to us. But Hannah is the co-chair of Drummond Woodson's Regulated Substance of Practice. Um, she does work with tribes across the country and marijuana businesses in Maine. Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont on marijuana licensing and regulatory issues. Um, so certainly has quite the experience on that. Dan, um, and Dan Rose is Drummond Woodson's practice group leader for labor and employment. His practice is focused on representation of private and public entities on employment and labor matters on a national level. So it includes discrimination, wrongful discharge, wage and hour, workers' compensation issues. Um, we have a lot to cover, so we certainly want to give them as much time as possible. So, Hannah, I really appreciate your yeah. time. Dan, we'll do a hand off here. I'll give you your seat. So, thank you. Of course. Well, everyone, welcome um, to our webinar on the impact of cannabis legalization on Maine summer camps. We understand through our representation of, of schools and employers across the state that this is a this is a huge issue um, that folks who work with minors. Uh, provide services for, for minors and our employers are struggling with. Um, and so I want to just kind of go through our agenda quickly. So we're planning today to talk first about the national trend towards legalization. I'm going to give you a brief overview of federal law, what's happening at the federal level. We'll talk about medical marijuana in Maine and adult use marijuana in Maine. And just so folks know, um, the language in this space is changing a little bit, so when I use the term adult use marijuana, I'm re referring to recreational marijuana. I think there's been a conscious effort, particularly because there is, nobody wants minors to be using marijuana. Recreational marijuana sounds fun. We're hoping adult use marijuana, um, you know, is, is a little less enticing. So when I use the term adult use marijuana, I, I'm, it's, uh, it's, I'm, I'm referring to recreational use marijuana. We're then going to talk a little bit about uh, campers and kind of what your obligations are with regards to camper use of medical marijuana and or adult use marijuana. Uh, Dan is going to talk to you about your obligations as employers if you have employees that um, ask to use adult use marijuana or medical marijuana. Um, and then I'm going to I'm going to do a quick note on on CBD products. Uh, these are ubiquitous in the state. Um, but the legal status is really complicated, and so I want to just kind of put that on your radar. And then at the end, we'll, we'll take questions, and hopefully we'll have some answers for you. Um, so national trends. I'm, I'm sure that folks have, have noticed that we really are seeing this trend towards legalization across the country. At this time, there are 33 states plus the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico that have legalized medical marijuana. There are 10 states plus the District of Columbia that have adult use marijuana, legalized adult use marijuana, and that includes Maine and Massachusetts and Vermont, so a significant portion of New England. There are more states that are moving towards adult use legalization. Uh, New Jersey and New Hampshire's legislatures are contemplating legalization. One of the interesting things we're seeing is that 
initially legalization has come from citizens' initiatives um, and the vote, vote of the public. We're starting to see legislators realize um, that they're getting imperfect legislation through that process and that this is something that people want. And so we are starting to see states legalize marijuana through the legislative process. And we're likely to see that in both New Jersey and New Hampshire in the near future. The newly elected governor of Connecticut ran on a platform of legalization, and the governor of New York has been very vocal about his support for, for legalizing adult use marijuana. There's a couple of reasons why we're seeing this trend towards legalization. One is there's just this pretty um, significant change in public opinion. In 1969, 12% of the population supported uh, legalizing marijuana. In October of 2017, um, a Gallup poll found that 64% of uh, people were, were in support of legalizing both medical and adult use marijuana. If you break it down to just medical marijuana, it's about 76% of the population support legalization. Um, it's also one of the only issues at the federal level that's getting bipartisan support. Um, in addition to that, there's a lot of money to be made in the marijuana industry. Their predictions are that by 2025, nationally, it's going to be a $24 billion market. In Maine, if uh, adult use marijuana comes online in 2020, which is the expected date for, for sales, um, by 2022, it's anticipated that it will be a, a $225 million a year market for the state of Maine. Um, to put that into perspective, it's going to fall right in between our lobster market is about 400 million, our potato market somewhere around 150 million. So it falls into in between two of our kind of largest uh, economic um, commodities, and it's not it will not be an insignificant market. So what complicates marijuana legalization is that uh, marijuana continues to be illegal under federal law. Production, processing, and sale of marijuana is completely illegal. Uh, marijuana is a Schedule I drug under the Controlled Substances Act. Other Schedule I drugs include LSD and heroin. Schedule I drugs are um, the most danger or considered the most dangerous drugs, and there are significant restrictions on those on Schedule I drugs, including really tight prohibitions on research, um, which is one of the reasons we have really limited research around around marijuana. Um, you know, there have been, in, in light of the fact that states are starting to legalize marijuana, there have been some efforts um, to change its legal status at the federal level, but none of those have been successful so far. And so, you know, the federal government has taken a couple of tacks. The Obama administration, uh, I think they recognized this as a, as a complicated states' rights issue, and they issued a series of policy memos instructing U.S. Attorney General not to interfere with state legalization efforts unless certain kind of enumerated federal enforcement priorities were implicated. This did not change the fact that marijuana was illegal at the federal level, but was essentially saying, look, we don't see this as a huge priority unless we're talking about cartel involvement, diversion to states where it's illegal, minor use, and so we're not going to use our limited resources to prosecute people who are operating in compliance uh, with state. Uh, with state law. Uh, under the Trump administration, they've taken their, their, their policy is a little less clear. Um, we've seen a series of conflicting statements from the president. The former Attorney General Jeff Sessions rescinded the Cole memo in January uh, of 2018 and instead instructed U.S. attorneys to exercise their discretion uh, to prosecute um, on an individual basis, that there wasn't going to be this kind of umbrella policy that you couldn't or shouldn't prosecute state legal marijuana businesses, and if you wanted to as a U.S. Uh, prosecutor in Texas, but you didn't want to as a U.S. prosecutor in Maine, it was within your discretion. Um, and this means that the views of local U.S. attorneys are really important. Um, the U.S. attorney in, for the District of, of Maine has taken a really similar position to um, the Cole memo and said, look, this isn't a priority of, of ours, but if you are engaging in conduct that's outside the, um, outside the confines of state law, then we, we will prosecute you. And we have seen some prosecutions in the state. And again, there have been some legislative efforts to address the disconnect between federal and state law, and none have been successful. What we anticipate kind of the first step 
might be is something that codifies the Cole Memo, so not national legalization of marijuana, but something that says, look, if you're operating in compliance with a state that has a robust regulatory regime, you won't be violating federal law. But if you're operating in a state that hasn't legalized, you will be. So medical marijuana in Maine. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of history first. Um, medical marijuana was first legalized in Maine in 1999. Maine was actually one of the first states to legalize medical marijuana. We did not, however, put in place any sort of commercial marketplace for medical marijuana until 2006. Um, Maine's medical marijuana program is considered one of the more liberal systems in the, in the country. Uh, Maine is one of the only states that has reciprocity, so we'll re we um, allow uh, main businesses to sell medical marijuana to people from out of state who have medical marijuana cards from those states. Nevada is the only other state that does that. Um, and uh, so 2006, there was a substantial overhaul that created a commercial sources for medical marijuana, and then that the system was again substantially overhauled in it's July of 2018, and I apologize, that's a typo. And um, that law just went into effect in December uh, of, of of 2018, and it really um, it, it, it made our law even more liberal and kind of candidly recognized some of the commercial aspects of medical marijuana that were not legal but were happening anyway. So how does, I'm going to just give you kind of a brief overview of how medical marijuana in the state works. So the only people who are allowed to purchase medical marijuana are qualifying patients. But, and a qualifying patient has a right to use medical marijuana. Um, the law used to require that in order for, in order to get a certification, not a prescription, prescriptions are, are federally approved drugs, but a certification pursuant to state law from a physician or a physician's assistant, um, an individual would, would have to have one of an enumerated list of qualifying conditions. And we see this across the country, almost every state except for Maine now, has a law that says you can only get medical marijuana if you have cancer or epilepsy or um, some of the more liberal systems have kind of a broad catch-all, um, irretractable pain. In the, the overhaul that happened in 2018, the legislature removed the list of qualifying conditions. So Maine is now the only state where you can go to a doctor and a doctor can make an assessment about whether or not they feel like you would benefit from marijuana regardless of whether or not you have a diagnosis and they can issue a certification for use of medical marijuana. Um, certifications can be issued by both by either a physician or a nurse's practitioner who, that are licensed in the state of Maine. The law does require that you have a bona fide patient provider relationship and one of the changes to the law recently is that there has to be, at least for the, for the initial uh, issuance of a certification to use medical marijuana, there has to be an in-person um, exam by the physician. Um, minor qualifying patients. So minors are also entitled to access medical marijuana under certain conditions. So for minors, uh, a physician or a physician's assistant can issue a certification for medical marijuana for individuals who are under the age of 18 if the patient has a medical diagnosis of epilepsy, cancer, or a developmental disability or an intellectual disability that in the medical provider's professional opinion may be alleviated by the therapeutic or palliative medical use of marijuana. So if an individual has one of those three things, the doctor can just issue the certification. Doctors can also issue certification for other reasons. But in order to do that for a minor qualifying patient in Maine, they do have to consult with a physician who has who is registered with the Department of Health and Human Services as having some sort of expertise or, or better understanding of medical marijuana. Because again, as a Schedule One drug, there's really been limited research around uh, the, the actual effects of medical uh, marijuana. Um, qualifying patients under the age of 18 may not smoke marijuana. They can only take marijuana in uh, edible form. Smoking includes vaporizing. They cannot vaporize. They cannot, they can't smoke marijuana flower. The definition of smoking does not include use of a nebulizer, though, if that's, if that's clear. Where can patients get medical marijuana in Maine right now? Um, they can grow it themselves if they're over the age of 18. If they're a minor, their parents who would be a caregiver, parents would parents have to consent 
before a, 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 a minor can, can get a marijuana certification. A parent can get a caregiver card and can cultivate marijuana for, um, for their, their minor, their child who's a qualifying patient. They can buy it at one of eight dispensaries in Maine. I think there's a lot of confusion right now because there's a lot of stores opening up, but the reality is, is that in Maine there are only eight registered dispensaries, which are larger, more sophisticated operations. They're allowed to um, have unlimited plants and serve unlimited patients. They can also buy it from a medical marijuana caregiver. These are much smaller operations. They've gotten a little bit bigger since the change in the law. Um, but there are around, uh, there's actually now around 4,500 uh, medical mar marijuana caregivers in the state of Maine. But those are the, those, that's the only place where you can legally purchase uh, medical marijuana. Interestingly, there's no mandatory packaging or labeling standards for medical marijuana right now, and there's no mandatory testing. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about adult use marijuana in Maine. So uh, adult use marijuana was legalized by Citizens Initiative in November of 2016. Uh, shortly thereafter, the legislature, I think rightfully so, took a look at the law that was attached to the Citizens Initiative and felt that it was pretty significantly flawed. And they worked for about two years to pass an overhaul or rewrite that law. They passed the, the Marijuana Legalization Act in May of 2018. They're in the process right now of drafting regulations to implement um, that law. We do not think that those regulations are going to be drafted and we're going to actually have commercial, licensed commercial operators until the end of 2019, beginning of 2020 at the earliest. And depending on what happens with the legislature with regard to approval of the regulations, that may be kicked out until 2021. Some quick uh, overview of the limitations on adult use. Adult use marijuana only authorizes possession and use of marijuana for individuals 21 years of age or older. Individuals can only consume adult use marijuana in a private residence. This includes curtilage, so the yard, but it has to be a private residence. They can also consume on private property that's not generally accessible to the public. They must have explicit permission um, from the property owner. So as a property owner, as a camp, you could theoretically give um, individuals permission to use adult use marijuana on your property and they would allow, be allowed, um, I'm assuming most camps are not generally accessible to the public, so under this particular provision, they would technically be uh, allowed with your express permission to use adult use marijuana on campgrounds. Um, other limitations on adult use, people cannot use adult use marijuana while they're driving a vehicle, um, at a daycare or babysitting center when the, during uh, hours when children are there. <laughs> Makes sense. In a designated smoking area, uh, as provided by the Workplace Smoking Act, um, and, uh, or in any public place or public area where smoking is prohibited. Again, there's really, folks, when the law passed, People were complaining that people were going to be walking down the street smoking marijuana, but really the only places that you can do it are, are, are on private property with permission of the, the owner and in your own home. So we don't have a commercial marketplace. People can't, there are no stores where people can go in and buy adult use marijuana. That's not going to happen until about 2020. And so where can people, what can people do right now under the law? Uh, an individual 21 years of age or older can possess up to 2.5 ounces of marijuana or five grams of concentrate. To give you an idea of what that looks like, um, that's 2.5 ounces of marijuana flour and five grams of um, cash. Uh, adults can cultivate up to three plants on their own property for their own personal use. They can use marijuana in a private place, but again, there are no legal commercial sales. You cannot legally purchase uh, adult use marijuana in the state of Maine right now. All right, so what does this mean for, uh, for campers, for folks who are attending your summer camp? And um, I want to start by talking a little bit about um, both federal and state laws that require public accommodations, which a camp would be, to make reasonable accommodations um, for folks with disabilities to allow them to access the public accommodations. So you've got the Americans with Disabilities Act for school if you have 
um, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. There is case law out there, Ninth Circuit Court case law, that says that um, the ADA does not require, the Americans with Disabilities Act does not require public accommodations to allow use of medical marijuana um, regardless of whether or not a person has been issued a certification by a physician or the person asserts that they cannot access that public accommodation without being able to use marijuana. The court said um, marijuana is prohibited by federal law and, there's, and there is an exception um, to the ADA that, that says legal use of drugs is, is not a reasonable accommodation and that even though medical marijuana is legal at, in some states, that does not change the fact that under the AD and the federal law, it's an, it's an illegal substance and, and it is not. You, you as a camp would not be required under the ADA to allow, um, uh, to, to, allow to modify your, your, your policy prohibiting the use of illegal drugs to allow a, a camper to use medical marijuana. So there's a, and I'm going to talk, there's a, the Maine Human Rights Act may also apply, but I first want to talk about this anti-discrimination provision in the medical marijuana law. So the medical marijuana law has a provision that says a school, employer, or landlord may not refuse to enroll or employ or lease to or otherwise penalize a person solely for that person's status as a qualifying patient or primary caregiver unless failing to do so would put the school, employer, or landlord in violation of federal law or cause it to lose federal contract or funding. So this provision only applies to medical marijuana, and you'll note that it does not, it, it specifically lists schools, employers, and landlords. We do not believe that this provision would apply to camps. They know camps exist. They could have said camps. They didn't say camps. They said schools. Um, so we don't think that under this provision, you, this provision would govern your treatment of campers. It may apply, apply to camp employees, and Dan will talk about more about that when, you get to the, when we get to the section on, on employees. The Maine Human Rights Commission, or the Maine Human Rights Act, uh, similar to the ADA in Section 504, prohibits discrimination of people with disabilities and requires um, public accommodations to make reasonable modifications to allow individuals with disabilities to access um, the public accommodation. The Maine Human Rights Commission um, really has only spoken to the issue of medical marijuana on one occasion, and that was in the context of a landlord tenant. And the landlord reached out to the marijuana, I mean, the, the um, Maine Human Rights Commission to ask if they were required by law to accommodate a request to use medical marijuana. And um, the commission's position, and this was in 2012, was uh, that um, if the individual had, uh, had provided proof of a disability, if it wasn't obvious, and then their medical marijuana certification card, the landlord could allow it. But if the landlord had a general no smoking policy, the landlord could prohibit them from smoking the marijuana on, uh, in their in in their apartment or the home that they were leaving. Um, and importantly, I think um, the commission pointed to this state anti-discrimination provision in the medical marijuana law, which again doesn't apply. Um, we don't think apply would apply to, to campers, uh, but this may be informative in the employee context. I want to talk a little bit about administration in schools. Um, I think so. The, the medical marijuana explicitly requires schools to allow students to access medical marijuana on school grounds. Again, we do not think that this would apply to camp because it, it uses the word school and doesn't use the word camp. Um, that being said, it, it, to the extent uh, a camp wants to allow it, it gives a helpful framework for kind of what the, the law requires for, for administering medical marijuana in a, in a public place where there are other children. And so what the medical marijuana law requires with regard to schools is they require schools to allow an adult caregiver, and that is either a parent or a caregiver that's been issued a certification from the Department of Health and Human Services, which includes a, criminal, a fingerprint-based criminal background check, 
um, to administer medical marijuana on school grounds. That parent or designated uh, caregiver can come on to school grounds for purposes of administering the medical marijuana to the minor qualifying patient, but they then must leave with the medical marijuana. The student is not allowed to possess medical marijuana, and neither the school nor the school nurse holds on to the medical marijuana. School staff are not permitted to possess medical marijuana on school grounds or use medical marijuana on school grounds. And again, just as the law generally prohibits uh, minors from smoking, the exception being using a nebulizer, um, the law uh, makes it very clear that minors cannot smoke uh, medical marijuana um, on school, school grounds. Um, again, we don't think this applies to camps, but we think it helps give some context to you know, how might you allow this if you wanted to. Campers from out of state, I know a lot of the camps around the state have campers that are coming from other states and, and perhaps even states that have legalized marijuana. But even though medical marijuana is legal in Maine, it cannot be transported over state lines, even if it's coming from another state where marijuana is legalized. There is a provision in the law, Maine's law, that permits visiting qualifying patients to access marijuana from main dispensaries or caregivers. So theoretically, you could have a camper who's coming from, say, Vermont, who meet, who does everything that they need to do to be a visiting qualifying patient in the state of Maine and purchases their, their medical marijuana in the state of Maine and that potentially, if you wanted to allow it, use it um, while they were at a camp here, but nobody can transport marijuana over state lines. And it's also important to remember that each state has different laws regarding who qualifies to use medical marijuana. And so um, it's one of the reasons most states don't have reciprocity is because there's, there just is a, you know, some states will only allow the administration of medical marijuana to minors for epilepsy, that's it, or even to adults for epilepsy. And then there are other states who, like Maine now, who, has, who have no qualifying conditions. So I looked, um, I took a look at the American Camp Association's guidance, and as far as I can tell, they have some pretty limited guidance on camper use of medical marijuana. Um, certainly, they emphasize that you should consult with legal counsel if you're confronted with a prospective camper who is seeking to use medical marijuana. Um, I'm going to, you know, the bottom line, uh, and I'll get to this slide next, is camps, are, camps in Maine are not required to allow campers to use medical marijuana under either, they're just not required to. I think a camp could, within its discretion, allow a camper to do so. Um, but what the American Camp Association has recommended that you do before you do this is, is really consider um, the consequences, even if you choose to allow use, consider that there's well-documented body of research identifying the use of marijuana can impair an individual's ability to function, and that apparent uh, impairment may, um, you know, that may have some significant consequences for traditional camp activities, canoeing, rope course, rock climbing. So again, bottom line, we don't think you're required to permit the use of medical marijuana by campers. If you do choose to accommodate a camper's use of medical marijuana, you should certainly consult with legal counsel. You should have some really tightly written policies um, governing such use. I mean, some of the things you might want to consider is requiring proof that the student holds the current certification. Um, you know, you could require notes from the doctor. You would. Uh, you know, require that the parent come online, come on on uh, campgrounds and administer it. And you want to, if you're going to allow it, you want to make sure your policy clearly outlines the very limited circumstances and at every aspect under which it's used. You can come on and administer it. You can only administer it here, and then you have to leave with it. Um, if that's really important. You also want to consult your insurance um, company and your insurance policy to see if it may have an impact on that. You may want to consider some additional waiver language. Again, marijuana can be an impairing substance. It, not, there are also other um, prescription drugs that, that individuals, campers, and probably staff take that can also be impairing. Um, and so I also encourage you to think about it in the context of it, marijuana is not the only impairing drug that people may be um, uh, seeking to, to use um, on campgrounds. But 
again, you want to make sure that you're protecting yourself. And even if you don't want to allow medical marijuana, you should probably take a look at your policies and make sure your policies, um, you know, you might want to consider a no smoking policy. I think you can treat marijuana and tobacco differently, but if you have, if, if you don't allow smoking on your property, it's going to be much easier if you have a written policy that says no smoking for you to just, if somebody wants to smoke adult use marijuana or medical marijuana for you to just say, no, we have a blanket policy that prohibits smoking, no smoking. And so regardless of whether or not um, you're going to you feel like you want to allow it or not allow it, we do strongly encourage you to take a pretty close look at your existing policies um, and make sure that they're really tightly written. Now I'll stop talking for a minute, and I apologize. <laughs> and Dan's going to talk to you a little bit about the employment okay. issues. I have to get myself all ready again. Like I'm just, Thanks, Hannah. Um, Hannah knows more about uh, all this marijuana stuff than I do. I'm an employment lawyer. Um, I'm also a camp person. Ah, you know, born and raised, went to camp from 9 to 14, worked at camps, you know, helped run a camp. Um, yeah, I know camp songs, and if we had time, I could play some camp songs for everybody. Um, camps are somewhat unique places. Um, you know, it says employees on your screen. For a lot of camps, we don't think of all these people coming in sometimes as employees. They become family. They're people who've been here forever. And um, but I'm here to tell you that you know that they actually are employees, and that the, you know that sometimes we have to let folks go and things happen. So um, there's some specific challenges about running a camp and um, and dealing with employees work in a camp. And, you know, we often think about the folks directly working with uh, campers, but remember, you might have folks working in the kitchen, you have maintenance, you have other folks as well, and just remember the different categories of folks you have working for you. And one of the challenges that camps have, and I'd say the first one is, is that um, we're dealing with safety, and there's probably, you know, more issues. Whenever you have someone working with children, uh, let alone working with children with axes and misery whips and you know these kind of fun tools in the woods if you're doing that kind of thing or or sorry that's the camp I went to you know or sports <laughs> equipment or whatever you know you you uh, uh, you have to think about safety first and you know we can tell you that this law hasn't changed anything um, in some ways for as far as employment goes it hasn't changed much but but it has made in some subtle way clearer that people are smoking that they're you know, when they're off grounds, they're smoking, and it raises the issue for camps about, you know, how do we know whether someone's coming, you know, working high, they got off their high, you know, they're, you know, they're on day off, you know, are they impaired, are they under the influence, what do those words mean? Um, it makes it a little tougher. Um, I think it's just, it's, it's always been there, but that's an issue. So my bias, our bias is always safety first. Um, we're going to go through these uh, different slides. Um, the overall thing I want to say to everybody is that this is both for, as far as employment goes, it's really simple. Um, but then as you get in the weeds, it gets complicated. And, and, and I'll try to explain that as we go. You want to lead me to the next? Yeah. All right. Um, you know, Hannah talked about policies. Uh, just to, to, to say to everybody at the beginning, um, you don't have to allow employees to smoke marijuana or to possess marijuana or to have marijuana while at camp. Um, you can say no. Um, that's generally the rule. And here you see the site to a statute that says that you can't construe this law to require an employer to permit or accommodate the use, consumption, possession, trade, blah, 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 blah. By the way, if people are actually selling marijuana at your camp, then obviously you'd hope you'd notice. Um, but but so you don't have to allow you know employees, campers, staff you know to do that. So that's that's easy. The harder part here is passing your policies. Uh, I just if you remember nothing else that I say, your policies need to be updated. Everybody should look at their policies before you know staff arrive, and you need to explain the policies. We were doing that yesterday for Drum Woodson. We were looking at our policies at our labor employment group, and it's actually tricky because you know uh, the policies will say you can't possess, use, um, uh, you know, or illegal drugs. 
And you're like, well, okay, but is it is it an illegal drug? Well, you know, Hannah's explained it's illegal under federal law, but it's legal under me. And so I don't want staff to be confused. Like, what does that mean? So it's a legal drug. So I, that doesn't apply to me. And so you're gonna have to rewrite that section. The other section you should pay attention to is the uh, you can't be under the influence. Um, or the other word you hear is impaired. And I have a bias about that, but let's start with impaired. I think impaired means something I can we can all get behind. That's where somebody has taken, you know, uh, smoked whatever marijuana, and they aren't the same. You know what I mean? They they they're they're, they're you know they're whatever they're doing. I can describe what they're doing. I, but anyway, they're doing stuff, and and so they're impaired. Their ability to do their job is impaired. That we all get right. Um, and I'm going to talk in a second about how do we know they're impaired. Under the influence is a tougher concept for me. So suppose you have somebody who works in the kitchen, and they have a bad back, and they've been with you forever, and you know they have a bad back, and they take some kind of pain medication, an oxycodone, oxy, whatever. Um, obviously, I know very little as I get into the details of these medical things, but, but, so, but that's what allows them to do their job. Obviously, they're under the influence. They're not impaired. But they're under the influence of this drug because it allows them to stand up and, and do their job. Well, the same is probably true if they're taking instead of oxycodone or whatever medical marijuana. So they they may be under the influence in the sense that it reduces their pain, but they're not under the influence and in that they're impaired. That's where it goes really simple. The simple part is no having, possessing, using, or whatever on property. That's easy. And then you start getting into the weeds about what does it mean to be under the influence? And it starts to get complicated. The word impaired, the, the first question that you should have uh, as you're rewriting your policy is, you know, how do I know? Um, when I'm really mean and someone calls me, you know, a camp director calls and says, you know, look, I've got this uh, counselor, you know, she's 22, she's, you know, and she reeks of weed. And, and I'll say, how do you know? And they'll be like, what do you mean? Like, well, how do you know she reeks of weed? Well, I went to a concert when I was, you know, you know what I mean? There's like this awkwardness on the phone and it's, you know what I mean? But, but honestly, how do you know? Um, and that raises the issue of drug testing. And, and I don't know of a camp that has standard drug testing. In Maine, you have to get approval from the, the, the DOL to have a drug testing program. And drug testing programs for marijuana are not all that effective because they don't tell you whether the person's impaired now. They tell you whether in the last, 30 days, 60 days, whatever. It depends. Uh, Inactive THC can stay in your bloodstream and can show up on a urine test or a blood test for uh, for 60 days. So that's not actually that helpful. So you're going to have to think about how are we going to tell if people are impaired? Are we going to have, uh, is there a nurse that works at the camp who's done some, you know, whatever, who can do some assessment? We don't have to be perfect. I mean, this isn't a criminal thing. We just have to be pretty good. You know, and just as a, a tip for folks, it's important when you're training your staff to say, you can't smell of weed when you're at camp, just like you can't smell of alcohol. I don't know if you're impaired or not, but it's not appropriate to work with children smelling like that. And that's harder than it sounds. It's good to explain, but, you know, but my wife has cancer and a car smells, put on something else. But it's important. So anyway, that's where it's simple, but, but complicated. We can go to the next next slide. Uh, this is a copy of the uh, uh, medical marijuana law. It supports what uh, Hannah and I have been saying, which is uh, you can't require an employer to accommodate the ingestion of marijuana in a workplace or work while under the influence of marijuana. Again, I don't know what under the influence means, but to me, it, it, an easier thing is impaired. Um, and then below is the law that you've already seen. So we can move on from there. Um, by the way, if you have uh, CDL drivers, commercial drivers, obviously they can be tested pursuant to the federal system, and the federal system has uh, requirements for, uh, you know, uh, marijuana levels, and we have to comply with that. And if they fail that, they fail that. Um, I'm worried about having people drive. Uh, you know, so that's a whole other conversation about what we do for for drivers, for people that are, you know, there's the, the major drivers, but then there's day trips and there's stuff and, and vans and stuff, and this stuff gets really serious when we start talking about people driving. Um, all right, so where are we? 
uh, conflict with federal law. Uh, there's the drug testing requirements under the federal law. There's a federal weapons law that talks about, you know, buying, uh, selling guns, and that I don't think that's going to apply to us. But it's even um, even possession of a firearm. So I I don't know if you see possessing firearms protect perhaps for a camp shotgun for camp activity. Yeah. Um, but it is illegal to have to be in possession of a firearm and a controlled substance does not matter that it's legal under Maine law because medical marijuana and adult use marijuana are illegal under federal law. You cannot have to be in possession of both of those things. And that would go with our policy where we're not going to let someone possess, use, or be, you know, be impaired, you know, at our camp. So um, Federal Drug uh, Free Workplace Act, um, if we are, if any camp is, receives federal funds, um, that's a requirement that you you have a policy that's a drug free workplace policy, and you follow that policy, and it requires basic things that we you know that we say we're drug free, that we and and uh, um, and if you need help with a policy like that, just ask us because we've written a thousand of them. I was talking a lot at the beginning, now I'm going fast now, okay. so I don't. I'll I'll pay more. I'll pay better attention now. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, just jump in anytime you. Okay. Um, so some of the things that have come up, um, you know, and I don't want anybody to get lost. Uh, if, if you remember nothing else, remember that we, you know, we. Who said just say no? no? Just we can say no at our camps, and that's what you should remember. We can say no. There are nooks and crannies, and so, so OSHA, uh, which does apply obviously to all of us, um, it has a catch-all general duty clause that says that, you know. Your workplace should be safe. Recognize hazards that are causing or likely to cause. So, you know, I haven't seen any cases about, but if you you say we can't have marijuana at work, you can't have weed, you can't be under the influence, you're okay. But uh, this comes up, you know, just to make sure that we've said that and we can show we've said that. It's interesting when you, you know, the law says you can't discriminate on the basis of someone's use of medical marijuana and somebody is driving a forklift for us and they tell us, that I use medical marijuana. I have yet to see the case where, you know, OSHA comes in and says the fact that they are using medical marijuana creates a safety hazard. I, I, I don't know how that's going to come out. Um, it's odd to me a little bit because that, you know, what you're saying to that person is go ahead, take oxycodone, that will be better. Um, but but uh, I would do what I normally do if I was at camp and make clear about my rule about no drugs or alcohol if I can. Um, criminal uh, accomplice liability, uh, skip that. I mean, that's if we help or we are involved with or we induce somebody, we're not doing that. We're, we're, we're both mostly saying no. Civil liability, so if you hired, I mean, this, I, I have yet to see a case like this, but I mean, I, it does happen with camps in other contexts. If you, there's an obligation when you hire someone to take reasonable care. You know, that's why when we hire someone to work with children, we make sure that we've done a criminal background check. If you haven't, obviously you're, you're hearing this for the first time, write that down. But we also check references and we do those things because if we don't, there's a reason why there's been issues with pedophiles being at camp because there are kids there. And at least when I was, you know, a camper and when I worked at camps, we were not good at this. And at one of the camps I worked at, you know, the director of the camp was an abuser. Um, we need to be sure that people are safe. And if you have information or you don't do the basic things you need to do to make sure that people are safe, this could come back to you. Yeah, I camp. wanted to know, one of the things that I've been thinking about is, is you know, when, we, when most people think about marijuana, they think about marijuana flower. And that's a pretty distinct product and it's pretty easy to detect. Um, we're seeing, I mean, the, the forms in which marijuana is, uh, marijuana is taken now is evolving. And we're seeing a lot of products that look just like a Hershey bar or look just like a brownie or look just like a bottle of soda. And so there are a lot of risks involved um, with if you do have staff members that are bringing these products onto a campground and, and someone could accidentally imbibe them. And this isn't something that's happening in Colorado. It was a huge issue. And in Colorado, they now require any product that's an edible have a stamp on the product itself um, that indicates a universal stamp that it's, it's marijuana. One of the things that was happening in Colorado is that up in the ski resort, um, people would leave like half 
eaten candy bar that were just in like the foil wrapper. So it didn't have the wrapper that said, this is an infused candy bar, and, um, and uh, house cleaning staff were picking it up. Um, or even it had, and it wasn't in, it wasn't in the language they, they were, were speaking, and they were eating it, and weren't realizing that they were eating. <laughs> it happened a lot, and these folks were being hospitalized because they were they were eating something that they thought was a normal candy bar. They were having some significant psychoactive effects, and they didn't know what was going on. Um, and so Maine's medical marijuana law does not have any labeling. The adult use marijuana law does have some significant labeling, tamper-proof packaging restrictions, but. That's something that I've been thinking about in the context of schools, but also it would apply to camps, but that's something that I'd be pretty concerned about. Um, it's just even the unintentional ingestion of uh, marijuana because of the forms that now can take. So part of that is, you know, you have your policy, train your, your staff, and then train your, your supervisors and directors. Um, because I, I was actually walking in the woods the other day, and this is just during honey season, and there's a hunting stand, and near it there was a chocolate bar, and I didn't recognize the name of the chocolate bar. It did, you know, what I mean, it was brown like a Hershey's bar, but it wasn't. It was half eaten, and so maybe the guy got high and walked away. I don't know, but I mean, I just, but I'm glad. I hope you didn't eat it. <laughs> no, I was, I was a little concerned by your story about 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 the the cleaning staff eating. But that's also just to say, it as a training thing, you you also tell your cleaning staff you're not to eat leftover things and. But for us, you know, one is make clear what your policy is, but then also train people as to what that includes. And, you know, rules about food in cabins, rules about those are really important to enforce. I mean, kids will, honestly, at least my experience, eat almost anything when uh, they're at they're sharing. They're, they're, they're camp. Yeah. Yeah, and I think this is an emergent industry, and the industry is out ahead of the regulatory uh, regulations, and we're catching up, but I think because it still is relatively new across the country, best practices are quickly evolving, that we are having these instances where there, there are some regulatory steps that could provide some protection, like universal labels that aren't part of our laws yet, and probably will be a few years from now, and so there are more risks right now than there probably will be once we're more experienced with this. And for me, you go ahead, next slide. We actually, camps are good at this already with alcohol and stuff. We deal with teenage employees, we deal with, it's just ratcheting it up and making sure we're paying attention to these other things, you know. Um, all right, potential claims. I feel guilty about even having a slide called potential claims because then everybody's going to worry about. Um, the negligent hiring is possible. Negligent supervision is possible. This is a list of things, you know, I, 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 a failure to accommodate claim, disability discrimination, I, I really wouldn't spend a lot of time worried about that. I don't have a case where this has happened, but this is where someone would say, I've got a disability and uh, I, I need a reasonable accommodation that somehow involves their use of marijuana. Um, and and as, as, as Hannah said, the ADA, the federal law on discrimination disability, uh, does not apply. The main law, it's unclear. I've talked to the director, uh, Amy Snearson, of the Maine Human Rights Act about this. I, I don't know. I, I honestly don't think that they're going to say that that's a violation where we're going to have to allow someone to use a drug that's illegal under federal law, but we don't know. And I do think that can't, particularly because you're, a lot of your staff are overnight and they're staying for long periods of time, that it's a little bit of a different situation than when somebody goes to work at 9, leaves at 5, and can perhaps access their marijuana off workplace, outside workplace hours and off of the property. And so, um, again, it's, it's completely unclear, but I do see there being a little bit of a unique situation for, for camp. Let me say it this way. If someone would have to ask you, they would have to, you know, an employee would have to ask you because you absolutely can't have, under any circumstances, marijuana in a place where kids could access it. So if, if that couldn't happen, that would never be a reasonable accommodation. But if an employee were to come to you as a camp director and say, um, look, I need this. It has to be locked in the nurse's office, but I need this every day. I hate to say this, but, you know, call your lawyer and ask whether or not that's, that's reasonable. I don't think it is, but, but ask. Um, second bullet, independent claim under applicable state uh, legalization statute. Somebody could say, look, um, you treated me differently or you discriminate against me because I am, uh, uh, you know, a qualified patient. Um, We've seen that. That's definitely possible. Somebody could say, you know, I applied and you found out that I, you know, am, am a qualified patient. You didn't hire me. It would get wrapped in other things too, but that's a, that's a potential claim. Um, 
wrongful termination in violation of public policy, uh, I, you know, there's not a lot of, uh, we're an at-will state, um, don't spend a lot of time on that one, but it's, you know, it's, it's always a possibility because someone could argue public policy exception, um, but right now there isn't. Um, invasion of privacy, this is where we're talking not just about drug testing, which is here, but, you know, uh, the issue of privacy, we're, we're, we're not, we're, a, you know, none of these are public institutions, I assume, but if you, if you are a public institution, then you have constitutional issues. But privacy still exists even when you're not a public institution. And we all have certain expectations of privacy. And there, are, there is in Maine law a tort for invasion of privacy. Um, and then finally, uh, to the extent that we are a public entity, you have constitutional issues. How many more slides do I have? Am I doing okay? You, don't, you can talk about some of the litigation in Maine or you can save that for questions. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't have anything to say about there. I'll just tell you that there's no court cases in Maine and there are few court cases nationwide that will shed light on anything that I've said differently. In other words, take everything I've said, I think it's fine. There are cases that have nibbled around the edges um, uh, and cases that have talked about, uh, you know, we're not going to enforce the state law against the federal law. Um, go to the next slide. Bottom line. Oh, bottom line. Okay. I'm here. I'm there. I made it. Okay. All right. Done. All right. Uh, we can prohibit the possession and use of marijuana at work. That's also the whole thing under influence everything. Uh, we can prohibit employees from being impaired at work, and we we are prohibited from discriminating against somebody. And here's the words that you pay attention to on this last slide. Solely on the basis of them being a qualified patient. So somebody, so you have a, 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 a someone who works in the kitchen. Like I'm picking on people. <laughs> so, all right, you have somebody who who, who is, uh, a, a, is a is a, is a, is a counsel and smells of marijuana. You've warned him before. Seems glassy eyed. You took him to the nurse. Said, yeah, he's 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 wasted. Um, and you let him go. That's okay. This says you can't. And he says well, you can't because I'm a qualified patient. This says solely on the basis of them being a qualified patient. So this is somewhat one where. It's simply because they are a qualified patient or a caregiver that we don't hire them or we let them go. So it shouldn't come up. But we, we're not in the business of, of not hiring people or letting people go solely because of their status. It's all about, for us, it should be about performance and what we see. But uh, that's the law. Um, thank you very much. And I'm going to... I'm going to finish up. It looks like we have some questions on CBD products, and I want to talk a little bit about the status of CBD. Um, so CBD is the cannabinoid, which is, so the cannabis sativa L is both the marijuana and the hemp plant are the same plant. Um, they can't, marijuana, the difference is that marijuana has THC, which is that psychoactive component of marijuana, but both Hemp and marijuana have something called CBD. It's a cannabinoid. There's lots of different variations of cannabinoids. And there's um, marijuana and hemp have both been considered controlled substances under the Federal Controlled Substances Act. They've both been Schedule One drugs until uh, President Trump signed the 2018 Farm Bill on December 20th, 2018. One of the things that that bill did is it carved out from the definition of marijuana under the Controlled Substances Act. Hemp, hemp being defined as cannabis sativa L with concentrations of THC that are less than 0.03% on a dry weight basis. Um, everybody got really excited and thought that this, this meant that CBD, was, this was going to open up a national market for CBD products, which um, Prior to this, the Federal Drug Enforcement Agency was taking the position that these CBD products were um, Schedule One drugs, even though they're in the gas station and people are shipping them over state lines. The same day that President Trump signed the Farm Bill, the FDA issued a press release saying, exerting its jurisdiction, so the Food and Drug Administration exerting its jurisdiction over CBD products. And they took the position that because there is a pharmaceutical drug, an approved pharmaceutical drug, it was approved um, in September of 2018, but they started their drug approval process in 2013. Because there was an approved pharmaceutical drug with the active ingredient of CBD that um, 
companies could not mark, sell over state lines um, dietary supplements or food additives that included CBD. And it's actually a criminal violation to do that. And so right now, at least under the federal this guidance from the Food and Drug Administration, the only CBD products that people can can legally take are are this per, is this per, is epidex epidex trying to pronounce. Um, and it, it was developed by GW Pharmaceutical, and it is prescribed for seizures. Um, for what? Seizures? Uh, epilepsy, but then a couple of other different diagnoses that also involve seizure activity. Um, I suspect that the FDA, so the FDA, this is, this, is, um, this is not unique to CBD. This is, the law says that if there's any pharmaceutical drug that's been approved and has a particular active ingredient, that active ingredient cannot be marketed as a dietary supplement or a food additive, absent a regulation from the FDA authorizing that. I do suspect that the FDA may, um, upon a showing that it's safe, um, develop a, uh, a regulation that allows this. CBD is non-impairing, so it doesn't have the same psychoactive properties. I think the FDA's biggest concern is that there are a lot of unsubstantiated health claims being made associated with CBD. Um, so bottom line is that really, and I think you're, we haven't, it's been interesting. That, that announcement came in December. The federal government's been shut down since then. And so we haven't seen any enforcement action from the FDA. We are seeing companies, I mean, a lot of people invested a lot of money in CBD, and we are seeing these products, these companies continue to roll out. We haven't seen any enforcement action yet. I'm skeptical. I think that's because the vast majority of the FDA agents are not coming to work right now. Um, but it will be interesting to see. But, but right now, under federal <coughs> law, the only um, CBD product that somebody can really take is a prescription, a prescription um, drug. So now we can take, uh, if folks have questions that we haven't answered. Go up to the top here. So it, so it says here, so our edibles are legal in Maine as long as you aren't buying them or selling them. And just like we don't allow alcohol on property, we can make a policy that no edibles allowed on camp, but how do, how do we name it? Is it CBD, THC, marijuana? I mean, I, I think like Dan said, and, and Dan chime in if you want, uh, when, you're, when you're putting in your policy that you're prohibiting illegal drugs, I think you just want to be precise about what that is. And you can, including, including marijuana, um, so that you can make it clear that it doesn't matter to you that marijuana is legal under state law, that it's continue to be illegal under federal law, and you you have a policy prohibiting the use of all illegal drugs. And you don't have to specify, because it would take you forever, but I mean, this is why it's a policy issue. You know, if you think it's helpful to put a parenthesis and say, including edible products that contain marijuana, that's fine. Uh, just, you, know, you don't want to lose yourself in policy and list every possible thing, because someone's going to come up with something that you've never heard of. I don't know if we'd answered this one about CBD oils, lotions. Yeah, I mean, I'll say, I'll say quickly about lotions. The, the Food and Drug and Cosmetics Act, which I read last week in its entirety, is over a 1,000 pages long, and it's pretty complicated. And there's a question as to whether or not the FDA has regulatory authority over cosmetics. And it is possible that there is that, that a, a, a lotion or some sort of non-ingestible CBD product that doesn't make health claims may not be within the jurisdiction of the Federal Food and Drug Administration. I know I'm getting a No, this is really interesting. But I, I um know. and and so could potentially be possessed, legally possessed, but it is it, it's complicated. Interested in the idea of a lotion, you know, like a bike. A saw you know, or right. a lotion yeah. or um, but certainly anything that somebody cool. is ingesting is considered to either be a dietary supplement, a, a food additive, or a drug, and if it's not approved by the FDA. So are you saying in terms of lotions and salves that you really can't regulate it at this point? I'm saying that so the FDA has 
they have the authority to come in if they get notice that a cosmetic pro a cosmetic product product is adulterated and is causing harm. They can come in and do enforcement, but there's no they don't have authority over something before it goes on the market. So their guidance saying it, it's illegal to sell CBD products unless it's an approved drug okay. may not apply to this very narrow class. Um, but then again, a cosmetic that makes any sort of claim of therapeutic benefit. So if it says, you know, salve to help address inflammation or for arthritis, that would be a drug within the jurisdiction of the, the Food and Drug Administration. Thank you, everybody. Any so, other questions? No? No, I want to thank Hannah and Dan, yeah. Drummond Woodson, for, uh, for sharing this opportunity for us in education series. Obviously, Andrew Scoggin Bank as the sponsor for the webinar. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm sure we'll we'll have this available later on for for use and viewing. We'll, we'll have to edit the first eight minutes yeah. where you were muted. Well, I'm just I'm, I'm practicing like I did in my car on the way here. But um, again, really educational. I, I've learned a lot, and I really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah. yeah. Where it says